Hello, everyone. Welcome to Authentic Resilience. We will give the audience just a few minutes to get settled and we will start right at nine o'clock. For those of you who just joined us, welcome to Authentic Resilience. We will begin this webinar in about a minute. Give everybody a chance to join. For those of you who just joined us, welcome. It is now nine o'clock. We will be starting very shortly for Authentic Resilience. Good morning. My name is Chandra Johnson with the Utah State Library. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I want to share a few things about today's virtual environment before we get started. So individual video, audio and chat has been disabled for this presentation. We will be providing some information in the chat, such as the general agenda and any links Fatima shares during her presentation. If you have questions at any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A area. There will be someone, um, someone moderating that section the whole time. At the end of the presentation, we will be having some time for questions, so please type your questions in the Q&A area during that time as well. This presentation is being recorded, and we will send the link to, out to DHA and on the ULN listserv once we have it. So, and now, it's my pleasure, to introduce Fatima Doman. Author, speaker, and executive coach, Fatima Doman has motivated audiences across six continents to leverage their authentic strengths for transformation. A globally recognized voice in resilience, well being, leadership, engagement, and positive change. Fatima is passionate about empowering people for sustainable high performance at work and in life. For decades, Fatima has worked successfully with Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 clients, representing a variety of industries and interests, and with educators around the world. 
Her books, Authentic Resilience, Authentic Strengths, and True You have been featured by the Huffington Post, Psychology Today, Thrive Go Global, on TV, radio, e-learning, and her workshops have been licensed globally, and everything is now available online. Fatima, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. And it's, it's such a, a privilege and an honor, really, to talk to the library staff and the Bookmobile staff, because what you're doing out there is important work. I can't imagine something more meaningful than providing access to learning, to education, to books. So thank you for having me. And I'm going to now share my screen and we're going to um, move into the presentation. Here we go. All right. So today what we're going to talk about is moving from what's wrong to what's strong. And in my books, I have this three-step process, explore, empower, engage. So we're going to explore our strengths together. And then we're going to talk about how do you empower your own resilience? How do you become your own best coach? And then finally, we're going to consider how do you engage your strengths consistently going forward in your life? So everything that I'm going to share with you today is science-based. So I've drawn from, there are now over 700 global research studies um, that have been conducted, you know, that are peer reviewed and really uh, they're, they're open to scrutiny. They're, they're, a lot of these studies are, are from academic institutions and we're learning a lot about character strengths. So this is what we're learning. We're learning that our resilience goes up when we use our strengths consistently. You know, our energy, uh, achievement goes up, well-being, a general sense of life satisfaction and happiness. When we understand our strengths and when we use them consistently. And scientists came together uh, and they spent about three years at categorizing the strengths at, that you're going to learn about today. And they had representation. Um, there were over 50 of the world's most elite scientists that came together and studied these character strengths that we're going to talk about today. So I put something up on the screen and I'm going to ask you before you read it, if you're comfortable with this, I'm going to invite you to just close your eyes for a moment because I want you to experience this by tuning into your physiology, paying attention to your own physical reactions to these words. So if you're comfortable with that, just close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to read two very distinct lists of words. So one is the inner critic list. These are things that our inner critic tends to say to us, okay? We all have automatic negative thoughts. And um, Dr. Daniel Amen, who wrote the foreword to my new book, Authentic Resilience, he's the one that coined the phrase automatic negative thoughts. And all human beings experience these, and they actually have an effect on us, not just mentally and emotionally, but also physically. And then after I read that list of inner critic comments, then I'm going to read the inner coach list. And I just want you to pay attention to how differently you feel when you hear the two very distinct lists. Okay, so are you ready? Go ahead, close your eyes. And here's the inner critic list. Weakness, focus, problem oriented, fixed mindset, blame, judge, disregard, know it already, afraid of change, either or thinking, using the word but a lot in our sentences, and looking for offense. Now, let's shift to the inner coach list. Strengths, focus. Solution-oriented. Growth mindset. 
learn, respect, curious, open to change, creative thinking, using the word and a lot in our sentences, and looking for intent. So go ahead and open your eyes now, and hopefully you paid attention as you heard the two very different lists of words. And since we're not live and, and we're not really talking back and forth, I'm just going to share with you what I tend to hear when I'm teaching this live. People have told me over the years that when they hear the inner critic list, that they start to feel their shoulders, you know, just slump or they'll, they'll feel that their posture gets worse. Or I even heard someone say once that, you know, old knee pain started to resurface or back pain. And um, so they start to feel diminished and feel it in their body. And then when I've read the inner coach list, people say, you know, I found I started to stand up straighter. I could breathe more re in a more relaxed manner. I felt just, uh, you know, more empowered as you read the inner coach list. So these are the differences. This is how words that we say to ourselves or thoughts that we engage in affect us mentally, physically, emotionally, and it's very real. So another thing that I wanna share with you is the questions that you choose to ask and how different they can affect you and your circumstances. So when we're thinking about building resilience, I encourage people to use what I call strong questions. I call them strong questions because they're rooted in the science of character strengths and they're solution oriented rather than problem oriented. So when I was trained to be a coach at Columbia University, I remember we went through a lot of training on asking questions as a coach. And you can learn to coach yourself. Anyone can coach themselves and learn some of these basic principles. So rather than asking problem-oriented questions, if we ask ourselves solution-oriented questions, a lot of research has shown that goal attainment goes up even as much as 80% it's been shown in, in one study. So Imagine a solution has come about. What does it look like? Imagine asking yourself that question consistently when you're faced with a challenge. And then what are some ways you can start creating the solution? And which strengths can you leverage? Which of your strengths can you leverage for the solution? So these are strong questions. I have lists of these questions at the end of each chapter in my books so that people can start to develop this skill of coaching themselves with strong questions. And we've been talking about these character strengths. I put them up on the screen. And these are the 24 VIA character strengths. VIA stands for values in action. And you'll notice that they're categorized into six virtue categories. And I've also put our, our website up here where you can take the free strength survey. It, there's just a blue button that says take free strength survey. And the interesting thing, I got an email from the director of the VIA Institute on Character. And he said that someone around the world now, since this pandemic, someone around the world is taking this VIA strength survey every eight seconds. That's every eight seconds of every minute, of every hour, of every day. So this is just exploding. People are really interested in tapping into their character strengths. And these six virtue categories, they help us build our resilience. So for example, the wisdom category here, this helps you to gather information, gather understanding, and develop your own sense of wisdom in solving your own challenges. And then the courage category, having the courage to really look at a challenge and to be able to face it. The humanity category and justice categories are very similar. This is all about relationships, you know, teamwork, love, kindness, and these are, this includes your relationship with yourself. Do you extend kindness to yourself? So these help you to develop your resilience as well. 
the temperance category. So self-regulation, -reg self-control, things like forgiving others and letting go of things that are weighing us down. All of these help us to develop our resilience. And then last but not least, the transcendence category is all about meaning and purpose and being able to tap into something even bigger than ourselves. And we'll talk more about these as we go through the webinar. So something to know about character strengths. First of all, when they were classified by these 50 elite scholars from around the world, they classified them to be, a, to be named a character strength, had to be positive human trait, Okay, universally valued. They studied cultures all over the world. They really made an effort to, to understand that these character strengths are the same here in the US as they are in Asia, as they are in Africa, as they are in Europe, Australia. They wanted to ensure that they're universal and then also expressed at different levels. Did you know that there are over a sextillion possible combinations in a, an individual's strengths profile? So they like to call them signature strengths, the top strengths, because they're almost like a fingerprint. Um, they're that unique, the way that each human being utilizes their strengths is that unique. Um, and then the last I have here with an exclamation point, because I find this the most exciting part of the research, and that is that they're learnable. Any of us at any time in our lives can choose to build a strength. As a matter of fact, I coached a woman who was in her 60s and she wanted to build her strength of perseverance. Her top strength was curiosity and her lowest strength was perseverance. And she said to me, you know, I, I've run into this my whole life. I'm so curious. I take on all these new projects and they're so exciting and so interesting and I love to learn. But I find that once I engage in a new project, something else will, you know, pique my curiosity and I'll abandon it and go to something else. She wanted to build her perseverance and she did. And in a very meaningful way. And she, when she retook her character strengths profile, it had moved up significantly. So any of us can do this at any time. Um, so what are your top strengths? So all of you, uh, had the opportunity to go on AuthenticStrengths.com and take your free strength survey and then print out your uh, two-page report. And the thing to ask yourself when you look at that two-page report, your top strengths, those signature strengths that are like your fingerprint that I mentioned earlier, those are on average your five top strengths. So when you're looking at those top five strengths, ask yourself the question, does, do those feel authentic to you? Because you are the final judge on whether or not you're going to call those your top strengths. Um, also, do they show up often and energize you? Do others notice? You know, you may have heard people say, you're a natural born leader, or you're a great team player, or you really appreciate beauty and excellence. Um, so people have probably started already, you know, throughout your life, pointing out or observing some of your top strengths. Now you can start to, to really key into those con comments and help them to reinforce your own understanding of your unique strengths profile. And then also, if you are unable to express any of those top strengths on your list, would you feel empty inside? I know that that's very much the case for me. For example, one of my top strengths is social intelligence. And it has been difficult, this self-quarantine time, this pandemic, uh, you know, finding myself disconnected from, from being with others. So I've had to get creative. How do I create a connection with others when social intelligence is such an important, you know, strength for me and kindness is high for me as well. I like relating to other people. So I've made more of an effort than ever to connect with people virtually, to call people that I care about and hear their voice. And so each of us is different. And times may change 
but we can also become very creative to meet our own personal needs to use our top strengths. And when people are using their top strengths, you can spot them. So for example, did you know that there are verbal cues and there are nonverbal cues of when people are using their top strengths? So for example, verbal cues, you know, people might talk faster, they might use larger vocabulary and their voice may become more clear and stronger. And then nonverbal cues, you know, their eyes might light up and they might become more animated. And if they're Portuguese like me, they might use their hands. So you'll notice when people are using their strengths because you're gonna see more energy and engagement. And when you see that, even with children, when you see this, it's important to reflect that back to people and say, you know, you really light up when you're using your, um, you know, your gratitude or your, um, your curiosity. Um, so there, are, you know, just start to key in on the top strengths that you see in people. Your fairness, you know, some people really get energized and they want fairness and you can see it come out in their strengths. All of these strengths become very evident. So something else that I think is very important for all of us to understand is that there is a shadow side to strengths. A lot of times when you think about strengths, you think, oh, it's just always good. Well, yeah, if you use them optimally, but we can tend to either overuse a strength or underuse a strength. For example, especially our top strengths, we can have a propensity to overuse them. Uh, so gratitude is, is my number one strength. And I can tell you from experience that I have overused that strength many times. You may have heard the adage, he who is good with a hammer comes to think everything is a nail. So when I've overused gratitude, you know, I might be given opportunities to do work and I'm so grateful for the work that I have tended to take on more than I could handle and then ended up feeling very burned out. So that's an overuse of gratitude. Take a look at the list that I put up here. I've only listed a few examples, but curiosity when it's overdone can come off as nosiness. You know, zest when it's overdone can come off as hyperactivity and so forth. So it's not giving you the optimal results when you're overusing a strength. And you can underuse a strength. When people underuse a strength, they tend to feel burned out, stressed out. You know, they're just not tapping into what gives them energy. So we're next going to watch a video about demystifying happiness because understanding happiness it's a, it's a a set of skills that we can use to build our resilience to build our sense of life satisfaction so let's demystify happiness and then we'll come back and discuss it a little further In defining happiness, I like to skirt that definition a little bit. I use the word happiness as a handle to mean a couple of things. The first thing is that it's just positive emotions, right? We might be talking about happiness, but really we're talking about the physiological experience of an emotion that feels like happiness. We live in these cultures and these social structures, families, businesses, schools, that inhibit certain emotions and evoke others. We've spent an awful lot of time as a society looking at dysfunction and disorders. I've instead looked at the positive things, positive emotions and grit and resiliency and really with an eye towards what in this can we control? 
how is happiness a skill or a set of skills that we can practice? We have all these wonderful technologies that lead to great ease and great power, but that also are very effective at helping us numb how it is we're really feeling. We will pull out the computer that is in our pockets and that numbs the anxiety that we don't have anything going on and that we're not being productive. But it also numbs the positive emotions too. I'm really hopeful that as we look at the scientific study of happiness, what we'll actually be leaning towards is the understanding that a happy life is full of a lot of different types of positive emotions and that love and compassion and awe and astonishment and engagement and inspiration. And so if we're not letting ourselves feel anger or guilt or the difficult things, then we never really feel profound happiness or great gratitude. Gratitude is an interesting thing because it arises naturally in conditions of scarcity. So we can cultivate profound gratitude in our lives. But that profound gratitude will often just find us when we haven't had enough to eat that we are the most grateful for a meal. So I see gratitude as a route to a happy life and a skill that we can practice in order to not just cope with life's difficulties, but to really embrace those difficulties and then let the positive emotions emerge from within those. So this video was created by Louis Schwartzberg and he worked on blockbuster movies like Men in Black and um, uh, E.T. and others. He's had millions of hits online and, and I just wanted to give him credit for this, for this video. Um, and I think it's interesting when we look at uh, what we learned in the video about gratitude, gratitude being my number one strength, and it, and it mentioned that it arises in conditions of scarcity. It just reminded me of, you know, I'm an immigrant to this country. I came here when I was three years old, and uh, we were, our family was fleeing a war, and when we came to this country, my mother had been a school teacher in Angola, where we came from. When we came to the U.S., she went to work in a turkey plant and in canneries, working on the line. My father had had a farm. He went to work milking cows. And they would come home very exhausted. And I remember thinking that's, that's probably what led me to positive psychology. What attracted me so much is having grown up in an environment of stress, high stress, high anxiety, um, difficulty, financial stress. And I, I remember my mother would come through the house at the end of the day and she'd say things like, did you do your homework? She didn't speak the language, but she could check the math. Uh, you know, she'd come through the house with her hard hat on, still on her hairnet, you know, feathers stuck to her, but she would sit down and help with the math. So growing up in an environment like that really makes you dig deep. And I know that everyone out there, you know, we all have our challenges. They're different, but everyone has challenges. So what is it? that you can tap into that's within you, which of your character strengths can you tap into to build your resilience and to increase your level of happiness? So we know from studies on post-traumatic growth that there are certain character strengths that, he, that are more highly correlated than others to building resilience. And recent studies have shown that bravery is the highest correlated to building resilience. But take a look at this list, you know, kindness to self and others, love, that sense of connection, that sense of community really helps people build resilience. Curiosity and creativity, you know, imagining a better tomorrow is 
is very key to making it through hard times. Love of learning, gathering the information you need to help yourself. You know, honesty, looking at a situation honestly, looking at yourself honestly, and looking at where you can improve or grow. Perseverance, hanging in there, and spirituality, this sense of meaning and purpose. So these strengths are very highly correlated to resilience and post-traumatic growth. Now, I've created a tool that's in my book, and I'm, you know, based on our limited time together, obviously, I can't share all of the tools that are in the book, but this one I thought might really help people, and it's the Connect, Care, Create tool, and in studying much of the research that's out there on building resilience and how to deal with negative emotions, I created this tool. So, first of all, it's important to connect within. If you feel safe enough to really connect to whatever negative emotion you're feeling, the first way to do it is is to just get comfortable, take some deep breaths, observe that negative emotion you're feeling without judging it, shaming it, running away from it, and identify where in your body you're feeling that negative emotion. So I tend personally to feel negative emotions in my solar plexus area, you know, in my stomach, or my back, neck, and shoulders will tighten up. Just pay attention and start to become more embodied to understand what your body is trying to tell you. And then care for yourself. So this is where the science of self-compassion comes in. And you can take those deep breaths, continue to take the deep breaths and relax and imagine that part of your body, that negative emotion dissolving like an ice cube in hot water, just letting go of it once you've acknowledged it. And then in practicing that self-compassion, commit to self-care, to doing the things that will support you going forward. And there are many areas of self-compassion. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but part of it is recognizing that this is all part of the human experience. No human being makes it through life without adversity. So understanding that you're not being singled out can be very helpful to people in building their resilience and seeing that common humanity and understanding that, hey, others are making it through, I can too. That gives us a lot of hope in difficult situations. And then to create a positive new perspective. So, you know, think about your top character strengths and which of those is best suited to the challenge that you're facing. How can you utilize a top character strength? And when you do this, what you experience is the undoing effect of positive emotions. So this is Dr. Barbara Fredrickson's work. And she has found that when you focus on something positive, that it has this effect on negative emotions and it, and it in essence, begins to dissolve those negative emotions. And also there are many, many studies that show that when you focus on something positive, that your brain works better, that you perform better in cognitive tasks. So therefore you are accessing more information to solve the, the challenges that are ahead of you. And they did this by uh, you know, giving college students, um, uh, one group of college students was shown really negative films and read negative literature and just you know, exposed to a lot of negativity. And the other group of college students was exposed to positivity and it was all about solutions and creativity. And then they gave them cognitive tests and the group that was exposed to the positivity far outperformed the group that was exposed to the negativity. So when you're prepping for an exam or for a, for a really important project, you might want to fortify yourself with things that build you with energy and engagement and hope and so forth. So in my book, I also talk about whole person resilience. We're a whole person. And I only selected four areas. I've actually begun work on a new book where I go more in depth into seven areas of well being. But these four areas, I believe, are the core. So that's what we had time to 
discuss today, mind, body, heart, and spirit. And I'd like to take you through these one by one, just briefly, and help you to understand how you can fortify your mind, your body, your heart, and spirit to build your resilience. So for, for example, your mind, open-mindedness and reasoning. Did you know that when you engage in hobbies that give you energy, that this, you know, it, it enhances your mental capabilities. And when you learn to ask good questions and understand why good questions matter, um, when you connect with others, understanding their perspectives and their experiences, especially right now, this time in history, it's more important than ever to connect with others and to really seek to learn and to understand their experience. And then to analyze, you know, intended and unintended outcomes, you know, from any decisions that you make. So all of this expands your mind and it helps you to develop open-mindedness and reasoning. And then I also thought imagination and ideation was really important to talk about when we're thinking about resilience. So what ideas have shaped history before? And right now we're in a time in history where we're seeing it shaped right before our eyes. So how can we use our imagination to create a better tomorrow? This is very empowering and it helps all of us to move through challenges in a more positive way. Let's next look at body. And we're here we're talking about active relaxation. So active relaxation is different than passive relaxation. Passive relaxation would be like crashing on the couch, you know, with your remote control and just vegging out with TV. That's passive relaxation. But active relaxation has a much greater benefit. Why? It's things like practicing mindfulness or meditation or yoga or deep breathing exercises. This is where you're actively engaged in eliciting a relaxation response in your body. And this has greater benefit than just checking out. And I also wanted to talk about rest and recovery. And Ariana Huffington is a huge advocate for rest and recovery. And she's, you know, written a book about getting enough sleep and, and resting. And why is this so important? Well, did you know that when you're rested and you've had adequate time for sleep, that your immune, immune response on average goes up about 40%. So that in and of itself helps build your resilience, just taking the time to, regroup and to, uh, you know, raise your energy level. And so sleep is so vitally important. And I would recommend Ariana Huffington's book on sleep. I believe it's called The Sleep Revolution. Excellent book. And I write about it in my book as well. So next, let's talk about heart. And here we're talking about self-compassion, self-love. And Remember, we talked about self-compassion earlier in the Connect, Care, Create tool. So there are three key elements to self-compassion. The first is self-kindness. You know, we often think about how important it is to be kind to others, but if we're not kind to ourselves, it's very difficult to be a vessel uh, that can help other people. If if we are empty inside. And also that common humanity that I talked about earlier, understanding we're not being singled out, this is part of the human experience, and that collectively we're all stronger than we are just trying to go through life with a very individualistic out outlook on life. And then mindfulness is a part of developing self-compassion, just choosing to be present in the moment and the, the Connect, Care, Create tool that we looked at earlier is all about practicing mindfulness. You know, when you have difficult emotions to be mindful and present, and then also when you have positive emotions to really sink, let those sink into you and let those build your resilience to, to really soak them in and 
let yourself be boosted by those positive emotions. So being present and mindfulness is a big part of self-compassion. And then when we're talking about the heart, of course, healthy relationships, and this encompasses forgiveness and setting healthy boundaries and all of that. And our relationships are important. Why? Because we are social beings by nature. We thrive when we thrive together. So how can we build healthier relationships going forward? And in my book, I have a chapter on forgiveness and boundaries because when we're holding on to something that's weighing us down, some type of resentment, uh, that, that, that literally sucks the energy out of us. And understanding that the greatest gift we could give ourselves is to let go of things that are that have, we have been holding on to re, past resentments and so forth. And then how to develop healthy boundaries. You know, I studied the literature, um, that the best literature I could find, the best research I could find on these two topics. And I uh, studied the Stanford Forgiveness Project. Um, and all of these tools uh, are in the book as well. But, but for now, I just want to share with you that these are concepts that are definitely worth looking into. You know, if you're holding on to something, it was Buddy Hackett who said, while we're carrying a, a grudge, the other guy is out dancing. So it's important to lighten up and let go of what doesn't serve us. And in so doing, we build healthier relationships. And finally, spirit. So this is a sense of meaning and purpose. And we're not talking about religiosity here. We're just talking about, you know, what is it that helps you to feel to connect it to something larger than yourself? Where do you feel that ultimate connection? And really cultivating the opportunity to go inward and to connect with something larger than yourself. And I have a chapter in the book on the power of the words I am. Those two very small words can take you down a trajectory in your life. And so be very intentional in what you add to the words I am. And always endeavor to whatever you add to those two words, that it's constructive, that it's building you and your environment, your own world. How can you make those words, I am, work for you? And then finally, hope and gratitude. So when we're talking about hope and gratitude, it, did you know that posit many positive psychologists consider gratitude to be the mother of all virtues? Why? Because it's the gift that keeps on giving. When we're grateful for things, we start to focus on the things that we're grateful for and that list expands, it grows. Where you choose to place your focus will grow. So how do you build your gratitude going forward? It builds your hope as well. And at the end of this uh, session, we're just about to wrap up. I would encourage all of you to message in on the chat feature and list something that you're grateful for. Uh, it would be really interesting to hear all the different things that people out there are grateful for. So I want to issue a resilience challenge before we go into the Q&A. Uh, there are research studies that have shown that if you find a way to use one of your top strengths in a new way for a week, that your resilience will go up and anxiety and depression tend to go down significantly. So I encourage you to take this challenge. Take a look at your top strengths. Choose one that you want to focus on over the next week. Find a way to use it daily, every day in a new way for a week. And then just pay attention to the results. I mean, even if you just use it for five minutes a day for a week, this is what the research is showing. Anxiety and depression go down, energy and, and engagement go up, and the positive mood boost can last up to six months. So a one-week investment, even just five minutes a day for a week, 
can give you a positive mood boost that can last up to six months. Now that's an activity worth engaging in. So if you do this challenge and you want to write, you know, send us an email about how it went for you. I've listed our, our website address here. You can just fill out a contact form and send us your story. And if you'd like to have it included in any of the new books that I'm working on, I'd love to see your story just with your permission. And if, um, or just, just pay attention and really focus in on how this activity builds your resilience over the next week. So with that said, I want to encourage everybody here to bring their strengths to life. And we're going to turn it over to Q&A. Thank you so much, Fatima, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we're going to go into about 15 minutes of Q&A. So if you have any questions, please um, type them in the Q&A. And Fatima, we have um, the, our first question is, do you think it's more important to work on strengths around the middle of our spread or ones at the bottom? So actually the research has shown that where you get the most benefit is using your top strengths. And I know human nature is you look at your report and you tend to go to the very bottom. Oh, okay, what are my weaknesses? But this inventory doesn't measure weaknesses at, at all. So that's actually not what we as positive psychology coaches recommend that you do. Look at the bottom of your list and look at where you can improve, but rather where can you get more energy? So we would encourage you to look at your top five to eight strengths and look for more ways to use them. That's the solution focus rather than the problem focus. And it creates a completely different trajectory. For example, many of you may have heard of Noelle Pikus Pace. She won the silver medal in the skeleton. And just imagine careening down a track at 80 miles an hour, you know, feet first. And she was interviewed. I'll never forget what she said in her interview. They said, well, what would you say is key to your success? And she said, you go where you look. If you change where you look, even by a fraction, you go somewhere else. So I use that as a metaphor for if you focus on your strengths, you will go there. If you focus on your weaknesses, you will go there as well. So it's more empowering to focus on your strengths. And I'm not saying that we don't want to correct or to correct any weaknesses or to improve throughout our lives. Obviously we do, and we can build any of our strengths at any time, but look at it as a strengths building activity rather than a correcting of weaknesses. And for example, if I told everyone here to not think about the pink polka dotted zebra in the room, where does your brain go? To the pink polka dotted zebra, right? And instead, what if you, give your brain things to think about that will build you what you want more of rather than what you want less of. And that's the power of the new science of appreciative inquiry and the science of positive psychology. Okay, next question. How do you recommend utilizing the strengths of others, such as your team members or family? That's a great question. So the most important thing that you can do is to develop what we call strengths appreciation. So start spotting strengths in people, start really seeing the strengths, make an effort to do that, and then be authentic and genuine in how you reflect those back to people. Um, you know, we're not asking people to be, uh, you know, robots just kind of parroting this positive psychology language. It needs to be genuine. So when you see something, someone using a strength, uh, it's great to just acknowledge it in some way. For example, during the time that we were really sequestered in our home, my husband and I, I mean, you know, we love each other very much, but we were together a lot. And I found that one of the things that would lift 
our spirits and lift the mood if we ever started to get on each other's nerves. I mean, let's be real when you're some, with someone that much for a long period of time is that we would start to notice strengths in each other. And we would just have this habit of, if we started to feel a little frustrated with one another, just list three things that we like about the other person. Or, you know, I would start to, his top strength is humor and creativity. Those are his top two strengths. And he's a really funny guy. And I just made an effort to really notice when he was lightening the mood, when he was telling a joke and just not be so caught up in my own world that I didn't notice that wonderful strength in him. And when I would reflect that back to him, I'd notice he, that he would just stand up straighter <clears throat> literally, and, um, it made him feel like he was in his element. Everyone wants to be seen for who they really are. They want to be seen for their best self. So start making that effort with others. And I think that kind of leads into um, the next question was kind of like, there's a feeling of hopelessness globally right now on uh, so many levels. And it's so it's hard to find a source of strength um, because there's not, you know, a whole lot of things we can maybe ability, we have the ability to change. Do you have any suggestions on how, you know, you could look for strength um, right now? That's a great question. And it just reminds me of the late Stephen Covey. So I worked with Stephen Covey for many years. I worked at Franklin Covey for 20 years. And I remember his concept of the circle of influence and the circle of concern. And it has a lot to do with where you look is where you'll go. Remember the Noel Picus Pace analogy. But so he would draw two circles. And when I've taught this around the world, I would draw those two circles. The inner circle is, is your circle of influence. And it's what you can use, what you have at your disposal to influence situations. And the outer circle is the circle of concern. All those overwhelming things that are happening all over the world that start to make people feel like this is too much, this is overwhelming. And what we would teach is make a list of all that you can influence. Start to put your energy there. And as you continue to make that list, that list will grow because it's called the piggybacking effect. The more you focus on solutions and what you can influence, one idea will generate another, will generate another, will cause you to think about a resource or someone you can connect with or you know, somewhere you can go for more information. And that circle of influence will continually expand until it starts to have an effect on the outer circle of concern. So that's very much a positive psychology concept. And do you have any suggestions for balancing work and home right now, especially in the telework environment? Um, we're kind of, work and home kind of blends together. What it would be some suggestions for maybe keeping those things uh, separated? That's a great question as well. So from my many years in teaching productivity courses for Franklin Covey and, and also writing about productivity in my books, there are some things that we can do. We can create sacred space for ourselves, you know, separating work from our personal lives. We can identify certain times of day where we are going to build our own resilience. We are going to fortify ourselves during those times. And we're going to really focus on cultivating positive emotions, positive experiences during those times so that work doesn't bleed into our personal life and, and we can, and we are a whole person. So, you know, if I'm not happy in my personal life, it will probably have an impact in my work. And if I'm not happy in my work life, it will likely have an impact in my personal life. We're a whole being, but we can identify some really, you know, set aside some time to cultivate those positive emotions to kind of, it, it, it's kind of like a windscreen um, for uh, everything else just blowing into our lives um, without our permission. 
And it is during those times that we set aside for ourselves to build ourselves, to strengthen ourselves, that gives us the, the strength and the internal power to address the challenges that are all around us. The next question is, um, what, when you work with teams and you see people starting to apply this um, idea of working to their strengths and identifying strengths, what do you really, what do you start seeing in the teams if, when they start applying this? So I've seen great stuff. Um, when I go into organizations and we start to teach about character strengths and then people start to uh, seek to understand and see the strengths in each other, organizations can shift dramatically. I've seen organizations that their email lines, their email response lines, uh, they've made it a policy where people can just list their top five strengths, you know, so it'll have their name and their top five strengths, where on their name tags or name plates on their doors, you know, it'll have their name and then their top five strengths beneath it because people start to really feel that that's something that lifts everyone to understand and see one another for their strengths. I've seen organizations, um, healthcare organizations, you know, that we've worked with that uh, their, you know, their people are feeling overwhelmed and stressed out, right? And when they start to have a focus on strengths, and people start to be seen, it gives them that added measure of respect and acknowledgement that they needed to give them the energy to continue to give their all to their work. So if you think about the word respect, RE means to do something again. Spect comes from the Latin spectare, which means to see. To, so to see someone and to see them again, to take the time and the effort to really see one another. To give, that's probably the greatest gift that we can give our colleagues is to shine a light on one another's strengths, to illuminate one another's strengths. The deepest need of the human spirit is to be understood. Thank you, Fatima. Um, any questions that we don't, we do not get to will be in the chat transcript. So we will be able to go back and get you an answer and put them on our website or our Facebook page. But right now that's all the time we have. And we really wanna thank um, Fatima for her time and for doing the presentation. And thank you for joining us. Uh, Fatima, is there any last closing remarks you'd like to make? I just want to say to everyone, let your strengths be seen. So not only is it so important that we acknowledge and see strengths in others, but also to bring our strengths forward and let people see them in you. So have the courage to share your strengths with each other and to take the effort to let the people that you work with know, hey, this is what gives me energy. This is what I like to do. And to bring that forward. If more people start doing that, you might find that this person over here will say, oh, great, I'm so glad that the prudence is one of your top strengths. You like to cross the T's, dot the I's. That's great because creativity is one of my top strengths. So we can you know, fill the need in our organization by doing what we each love and by honoring the unique strengths that we each bring to the table. So I would encourage you to do that and um, stay strong and, and continue to focus on what you have rather than what you don't have. And you'll see that that list will expand. So thanks again for your time. Okay, thank you everyone. And again, uh, we, this has been recorded and we'll send out a link to DHA and out on the ULN listserv once the recording is available. And thank you so much for joining us and have a nice day. Bye everyone.